You know what time it is. You know what? This is why my dad had me in left field. Terrible. You know what time it is. Woo! Get into it! Get into it! Yes! We are back, lovelies. We are back. Now, I do apologize for missing yesterday's reading, but I'm here to give you a double feature today. So right after this, we'll be going immediately to Instagram to go ahead and read a series of unfortunate events. So because I want to stay concise and steady with time, let's go ahead and get started. No, I do not own the music that you're listening to in the background, which is brought to you, as always, by Mr. Amiats. Please go check them out on YouTube. Like, share, subscribe. And if you already haven't done so, the link to my YouTube channel for Storytime with Chris is in my bio on Instagram as well as Facebook. Like, share, subscribe, hit that bell notification so you don't miss a video, okay? Now, y'all, we're, we're finally getting into it. We finally getting into it. The Big Boss, a roar death lord, premieres in this chapter. And I'm going to do the best I can to give him the menace that he deserves. Chapter 19 The Death Lord The Gwithaith, greater than any Tarn had ever seen, screamed and beat its wings, churning a wind like a gale of death. Tarn saw the curved, gaping beak and blood-red eyes, and in another instant the Gwithaith's talons sank into his shoulder, seeking to grip the flesh beneath his cloak. The relentless bird pressed so closely that the reek of its feathers filled Tarn's nostrils, its head deeply scarred by an old wound thrust against him. Tarn turned his face away and waited for the beak to rend his throat. Yet the Gwithaith did not strike. Instead, it was pulling him off from the rocks with a strength Tarn could not resist. The Gwithaith no longer screamed, but made soft keening sounds, and the bird's eyes fixed upon him not in fury, but in a strange gaze of recognition. The bird seemed to be urging him to loosen his grasp. A sudden memory from his boyhood flooded Tarn, and again he saw a fledgling Gwithaith in a thorn bush, a young bird wounded and dying. Was this ragged bundle of feathers he had nursed back to life? Had the creature come at last to pay a debt so long remembered, which that creature was not introduced? If memory serves... Wow, not until the first book. Wow. So all the way from the book of three... Yeah, wow. That's a wow. Tarn dared not hope, yet as he clung, weakening to the side of Mount Dragon, it was his only hope. He relaxed his grip and let himself fall free. The weight of its burden made the Gwithay falter and drop earthward for a moment. Below Tarn, the crags reeled. With all its strength, the huge bird beat its wings, and Tarn felt himself borne upward, higher and higher, as the wind whistled in his ears, its black wings heaving and straining. The Gwithay pressed steadily aloft until at last... Its talons opened, and Tarn fell to the stone-crested peak of Mount Dragon. Akrid had spoken the truth. The short downward slope lay before him, clear and unhindered to the iron portals, which now swung open as the hastening army of cauldron-born streamed into Anuvan. The deathless host had drawn their swords. Within the stronghold, Gwydion's warriors had seen the foe, and shouts of despair rose from the embattled sons of Dawn. A troop of cauldron-born sighting the lone figure of Tarn atop the mountain summit, and the companions who now crossed the ridge broke from the main body of the host and turned their attack upon Mount Dragon. Brandishing their weapons, they sped up the slope. The Gwithaith, circling overhead, screamed a war cry. Sweeping its wings, the giant bird flew straight to the onrushing warriors and plunged into their ranks, striking out with beak and claws. Under the violence of the Gwithaith's unexpected charge, the first rank of Cauldronborn fell back and stumbled to the ground. But one of the mute warriors lashed out with his sword, striking again and again until the Gwithaith dropped at his feet. The huge wings fluttered and trembled, and then the battered body lay still. Three of the cauldron board had leapt past their comrades and raced toward Tarn, who read his own death in their livid faces. His eyes darted about the summit, vainly seeking a last means of defense. At the highest peak of the dragon's crest rose a tall rock. Time and tempest had gnawed into a grotesque shape. The wind, blowing through the eroded crannies and hollows, set up a baleful keening, and the stone shrieked and moaned as if with human tongue. Keening is another... It's a... It's... It is actually, it could be used as a verb and an uh, adjective to describe something and also an action. So, keening is to describe like, 
imagine like somebody crying, but like they're like screaming through it. That's a form of keening. A lot of people keen when they get really upset and they cry and huff, like heave and puff and can't catch their breath. It's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> the weird whale seemed to command to beseech to draw Taran closer. Here was his only weapon. He flung himself against the rock and wrestled against the unyielding bulk, struggling to uproot it. The cauldron born were nearly upon him. The stone crest seemed to move a little as Tarn redoubled his efforts. Then suddenly it rolled from its socket with a final heave. Tarn sent it crashing amid his assailants. Two of the cauldron born tumbled backward and their blades spun from their hands. But the third warrior did not falter in his upward climb. Driven by despair as a man cast pebbles at the lightning that would strike him down, Tarn groped for a hand full of stones, of loose earth, even a broken twig to fling in defiance of the cauldron warrior who strode closer, blade upraised. The socket from which the dragon's crest had been torn was lined with flat stones, and in it, as in a narrow grave, lay Durnwin, the black sword. Look at the universe. Okay, let's see what happens. Tarin snatched it up for an instant. He, His mind, really, he did not recognize the blade. Once, long ago before, he had sought to draw Durwin, and his life had been almost forfeit to his rashness. Now, heedless of the cost, seeing no more than a weapon come to his hand, he ripped the sword from its sheath. Durnwin flamed with a white and blinding light. It was only then, in some distant corner of his mind, Tarin dimly understood that Durnwin was blazing in his grasp, and that he was still alive. He's worthy. For all my... Here we go. From all my He-Man fans, for all my Thundercats fans, for all my Thor of the Marvel Universe fans, he is worthy. <laughs> Dazzled, the cauldron board dropped his sword and flung his hands to his face. Tarn leapt forward and with all his strength drove the blazing weapon deep into the warrior's heart. The cauldron board stumbled and fell and from lips long mute burst a shriek that echoed and re-echoed from the Death Lord's stronghold. As though rising from a thousand tongues, Tarn stra staggered back. The cauldron board lay motionless. Along the path and at the iron portals, the cauldron warriors toppled as one body. Within the stronghold, the deathless men, locked in combat with the Sons of Dawn, screamed and crumbled to earth even as Tarin's foe had fallen. A troop hastening to fill the breach at Dargate pitched headlong at the feet of Gwydion's warriors, and those who strove to slay the soldiers at the western wall dropped in mid-stride, and their weapons clattered on the stones. Death at last had overcome the deathless cauldron born. Shouting for the companions... Tarn raced from the peak of Mount Dragon. The Kamot horsemen leapt to their saddles and urged their steeds to a gallop, plunging after Tarn and into the fray. Tarn sped across the courtyard. At the death of the cauldron born, many of Aurorn's mortal guards threw down their weapons and sought vainly to flee the stronghold. Others fought with the frenzy of men whose lives were already lost, and the remaining huntsmen who had gained new strength as their comrades fell under the blades of the Sons of Dawn. Stoons shouted their war cry and flung themselves against Gwydion's warriors. One of the huntsmen troop captains, his branded face twisted in rage, slashed at Tarn, then shouted in horror and fled at the sight of the flaming sword. Tarn fought his way through the press of warriors that swirled about him and raced toward the great hall where he had first glimpsed Gwydion. He burst through the portals as he did so. Sudden fear and loathing plucked him. Torches blazed and flared along the dark, glittering corridors. For a moment he faltered as though a black wave had engulfed him. From the far end of the corridor, Gwydion had seen him and he strode quickly to Tarn's side. Tarn ran to meet him, shouting triumphantly that Durnrin had been found. Sheath the blade! Gwydion cried, shielding his eyes with a hand. Sheath the blade or it will cost you your life! Tarn obeyed. Gwydion's face was drawn and pale. His green-flecked eyes burned feverishly. How have you drawn this blade, pig keeper? Gwydion demanded. My hands alone dare touch it. Give me the sword. The voice of Gwydion rang harsh and commanding, yet Tarn hesitated, his heart pounding with a strange dread. Quickly, Gwydion ordered. Will you destroy what I have fought to win? Aurorn's treasure trove lies up open to our hands, and power greater than any man has dreamed await us. You will share with it, me in it. 
Pig Keeper. I trust no other. Shall some base-born warrior keep those treasures from us? Gwydion cried. Arorn has fled his realm. Predri is slain and his army scattered. None has strength to stand against us now. Give me the sword, Pig Keeper. Half a kingdom is in your grasp. Seize it now before it is too late. Gwydion reached out his hand. Tarn flung himself back, his eyes wide with horror. Lord Gwydion, this is not the counsel of a friend. It is betrayal. Only then, as he stared, bewildered at this man he had honored since boyhood, did he understand the ruse. A ruse is an illusion or a trap, or a prank. In another instant, Tarn ripped Durnwin from its sheath and raised the glittering blade. Arorn! Tarn gra gasped and swung the weapon downward. Before the blade struck home, the Death Lord's disguised shape blurred suddenly and vanished. A shadow writhed along the corridor and faded away. The companions now pressed into the Great Hall, and Tarn hurried toward them, crying the warning that Arorn still lived and had escaped. Ocran's eyes blazed with hatred. Escaped, you pig keeper? But not my vengeance. The secret chambers of Arorn are no secret to me. I shall seek him out wherever he has taken refuge. Without waiting for the companions we, who ran to follow her, Ocran set off all speed down the winding halls. She sprang past a heavy portal which bore the Death Lord's seal branded deeply in the iron-studded wood. At the far end of the long chamber, Tarn glimpsed a hunched, spidery figure scuttling a high, skull-shaped throne. It was Mag. The chief steward's face was ghastly white, his lips trembled and slave slavered, and his eyes rolled in his head. He stumbled to the foot of the throne, snatched at an object that lay on the flagstones, clutched it to him, and whirled to face the companions. No closer, shrieked Mag in such a tone that even Ocran halted in Tarn, about to draw Durwin from its scabbard, was gr gripped in horror at Mag's contorted features. Will you keep your lives? Mag cried, to your knees then, humble yourselves and beg mercy. I, Mag, shall favor you by making you my slaves. Your master has abandoned you, replied Tarn, and your own treachery is ended, he strode forward. Mag's spidery hands thrust out in warning. And Tarn saw that the chief steward held a strangely wrought crown. I am master here. Mag shouted, I, Mag, Lord of Anuvan, a roaring pledge that I should wear the Iron Crown. As it slipped from his fingers, it is mine, mine by right and promise. <laughs> he has gone mad, Tarn murmured to Fluter, who stared in revulsion as the chief steward raised high the crown and gibbered to himself. Help me take him prisoner. No prisoner shall he be, cried Ocran, drawing a dagger from her cloak. His life is mine for the taking, and he shall die as all who have betrayed me. My vengeance begins here with a treacherous slave and next his master. Harm him not, commanded Taran as the queen struggled to make her way past him to the throne. Let him find justice from Gwydion. Akrin fought against him, but Ilanwi and Doli hastened ho to hold the raging queen's arms. Tarn and the bard strode toward Mag, who flung himself to the seat of the throne. Do you tell me Aurora's promises are lies? The chief steward hissed, fondling and fingering the heavy crown. It was promised. I should wear this. Now it is given into my hands. So shall it be. Quickly, Mag lifted the crown and set it on his brow. Mag, he shouted. Mag the Magnificent. Mag the Death Lord. <laughs> the chief steward's triumphant laughter turned into a shriek as he clawed suddenly at the iron band circling his forehead. Tarn and Fluter gasped and drew back. The crown glowed like red iron in a forge. Writhing in agony, Mag clutched vainly at the burning metal which now had turned white hot and with a last scream toppled from the throne. Ilanwe cried out and turned her face away. Oh! No! No! Let me tell you something. I don't care how tough you are, how cool you think you are. 
it's something very unnerving to see anybody, let alone a young woman, like turn her face away because it's so ghastly that it's scaring her that bad. It unsettles you. I've had to do it for a couple of friends where something tra traumatic or crazy has happened and they're like, <gasps> and I have to hold them. And or it's usually me that needs to be held trying to look away from something very frightening. It's very unnerving. Gurgi and Glue had lost track of the companions and were now pelting through the maze of winding corridors, turning vainly to find them. Gurgi was terrified at being in the heart of Anuvan and at every step shouted Tard's name. Only the echoes from the torch-lit halls came back to him. Glue was no less fearful. Between gasps, the former giant also found enough breath to complain bitterly. It's too much to bear, he cried. Too much. Is there no end to the wretched burdens put upon me? Thrown aboard a ship? Hustled off to Kerdom and half frozen to death, dragged through mountains at the risk of my life, a fortune snatched from my hands, and now this? Oh, when I was a giant, I'd have stood for such high handed treatment. Oh, giant, leave off pinings and whinings, replied Gurgi, miserable enough at being separated from the companions. Gurgi is lost and Lauren, but he tries to find Kylie Master with seekings. Do not fear. He added reassuringly, though it was all he could do to keep his voice from trembling. Bored Gurgi will keep paint for little giant safe. Oh, yes. You're not doing very well at it, snapped Glue. Nevertheless, the pudgy little man clung to the side of the shaggy creature, and his stubby legs pumping matched him stride for stride. They had come to the end of one corridor where a squat and heavy iron portal stood open. Gurgi fearfully halted. A bright, cold light poured from the chamber. Gurgi took a few cautious paces and peered within. Beyond the doorway stretched what seemed to be an endless tunnel. The light came from heaps of precious stones and golden ornaments. Farther on, he glimpsed strange objects half hidden by shadows. Gurgi drew back, his eyes popping in wonder and terror. Oh, it is treasure house of evil death lord, he whispered. Oh, glimmerings and shimmerings. This is a very secret place and fearsome and not wise for Bird Gurky to stay. Glue, however, pressed forward at the sight of the gems. His pale cheeks twitched and his eyes glittered. Treasure indeed, he said, choking in his excitement. I've been cheated of one fortune, but now I'll be repaid. It's mine, he cried. All of it. I spoke first. No one shall deprive me of it. No, no, protested Gurgi. It cannot be yours, greedy giant. It is for my prince to give or take. Come with hastenings and seek companions even faster. Come with tellings and warnings for Gurgi. Also fear snappings and trappings. Costly treasures without guardings. No, no, clever Gurgi sniffs evil enchantments. Heedless of the creature's words, Glue thrust him aside. With an eager cry, the former giant sprang past the threshold and into the tunnel, where he plunged his hands into the large heap of jewels. Gurgi, seizing him by the collar, tried vainly to drag him back as flames burst from the walls of the treasure trove. Children, do you know the difference between a king and his horse? What is the difference between a king and his horse? Instinct. And Gurgi followed his instincts, knowing that a trap could happen. <laughs> Before the great hall of Anuvan, Gwydion rallied the last survivors of the Sons of Dawn and Kamot horsemen. There, the companions, with call squawking jubilantly overhead, joined them. For a moment, Tard stared searchingly at Gwydion, but his doubts vanished when the tall warrior strode quickly to him and clasped his hand. We have much to tell each other, Gwydion said, but no time for the telling. Though Anuvan is in our hands, the Death Lord himself has escaped us. He must be found and slain if it is in our power to do so. Gurgi and Glue are lost in the Great Hall, Tard said. Give us leave to find them first. Go quickly then, answered Gwydion. If the Death Lord is still in Anuvan, their lives are in as much danger as ours. Tard had unbuckled Durdwin from his belt and held out the sword to Gwydion. I understand now why Aurorn sought possession of it, not for his own use, but because he knew it threatened his power. Only Durdwin could destroy his cauldron-born. Indeed, he dared not even keep it in his stronghold and believed it harmless buried atop Mount Dragon. When Aurorn disguised himself in your shape, he nearly tricked me into giving him the weapon. Take it now. The blade is safer in your hands. Gwydion shook his head. 
You have earned the right to draw it, assistant pig keeper. He said, and thus the right to wear it. Indeed so, put in Fluter. It was magnificent the way you struck down that cauldron board. A flam couldn't have done better. We're rid of those foul brutes forever. Taran nodded. Yet I hate them no longer. It was not their wish to be bent in slavery to another's will. Now they are at peace. In any case, Hedwood's prophecy came true after all, Fluter said. Not that I ever doubted it for a moment. He glanced instinctively over his shoulder, but this time there came no jangling of harp strings. It's kind of sad, because he used the harp for firewood to keep them warm. Ah, oh, so sad. Ooh, it's 555. Make a wish. Hold your breath. Make a wish. Count to three. Come with me. And you'll be in a world of pure imagination. Never mind. Let's get back to the story. <laughs> but she did have a curious way of putting things. I still haven't heard any stone speaking. I have, answered Taran. Atop Mount Dragon, the sound from the crest was like a voice. Without it, I'd have paid no heed to the stone. Then when I saw how... Excuse <laughs> How hollowed and eaten away it was, I believed I might be able to move it. Yes, Fluter. The voiceless stone spoke clearly. I suppose so, if you think about it in that way, Ilanwe agreed. As for Durnwin's flame being quenched, and was quite mistaken. Understandably, she was very upset at that time. Before the girl could finish, two frightened figures burst from the great hall and raced to the companions. Much of Gurgi's hair had been singed away into ragged patches. His shaggy eyebrows were charred and his garments still smoldered. The former giant had fared worse, for it seemed little more than a heap of grime and ashes. Tarn had no time to welcome the lost companions, for the voice of Akrin rose in a terrible cry. Do you seek Aron? He is here! Akrin flung herself at Tarn's feet. Tarn gasped and froze in horror. Behind him coiled a serpent ready to strike. Tarn sprang aside. Dorwin flashed from its scabbard. Ocran had clutched the serpent in both hands as though to strangle or tear it asunder. The head of the snake darted toward her. The scaly body lashed like a whip and the fangs sank deeply into Ocran's throat. With a cry, she fell back. In an instant, the serpent coiled again. Its eyes glittered with a cold, deadly flame, hissing in rage, jaws gaping and fangs bared. The serpent shot forward, striking at Tarn. Alanwe screamed. Tarn swung the flashing sword with all his strength. The blade clove the serpent in two. Flinging Durwin aside, Tarn dropped to his knees beside Gwydion, who held the limp body of the queen. The blood had drained from Ocarin's lips, and her glazed eyes sought Gwydion's face. Have I not kept my oath, Gwydion? She murmured, smiling vaguely. Is the lord of Anuvin slain? It is good. My death comes easily upon me. Ocran's lips parted as though she would speak again. But her head fell back, and her body sagged in Gwydion's arms. A horrified gasp came from Mylonwe. Tarn looked up as the girl pointed to the cloven serpent. Its body writhed, its shape blurred. In its place appeared the black-cloaked figure of a man whose severed head had rolled face downward on the earth. Yet in a moment the shape too lost its form, and the corpse sank like a shadow into the earth. And where it had lain was sheer and fallow, the ground wasted, fissured as though by drought. A roaring death lord had vanished. The sword, cried Fluter. Look at the sword. Quickly, Tarn caught up the blade, but even as he grasped the hilt, the flame of Durwin flickered as though stirred by a whiff wind. The white brilliance dimmed like a dying flame, faster than the glow faded, no longer white, but filled with swirling colors which danced and trembled. In another instant... Tarn's hand held no more than a scarred and battered weapon whose blade glinted dully, not from the flame that once had burned within it, but only from the mirrored rays of the setting sun. Ilanwe, hurrying to his side, called out, The writing on the scabbard is fading too. At least I think it is. 
unless it's just the dim light. Here, let me see better. She drew the bauble from her cloak and brought it closer to the black scabbard. Suddenly, in the golden rays, the marred inscription glittered. The bauble brightens the lettering. There's more than what used to be here, cried the surprised girl. Even the part that was scratched out. I can see most of it now. The companions hast hastily gathered, and while Ilanwe held the bauble, Talison took the scabbard and scanned it closely. The writing is clear, but fading quickly, he said. Indeed, princess, your golden light shows what was hidden. Draw Durwin, only though of noble worth, to rule with justice to strike down evil. Ooh, excuse me. I am so, I'm so sorry. To strike down evil, who wields it in good call, shall slay even the Lord of Death. In another moment, the inscription had vanished. Talisen turned the black scabbard back and forth in his hands. Perhaps now I understand what was only hinted in the lore, that once a mighty king came about great power and strove to use it for his own advantage. I believe Durwin was that weapon, turned from its destiny, long lost and found again. Durwin's task is ended, Gwydion said. Let us leave this evil place. In death, the face of Akren... No longer bitterly haughty, was at last tranquil. Shrouding the woman in her tattered black cloak, the companions bore the body to rest in the great hall, for she who had once ruled Prydain had died not without honor. At the pinnacle of the Death Lord's Tower, the dark banner suddenly burst into flames and fell away into blazing shreds. The walls of the great hall trembled and the stronghold shuddered deep within itself. The companions and the warriors rode from the iron portals behind them. The wall shattered and the mighty towers crumbled and a sheet of flame reached skyward from the ruins where Anuvin had stood. And that is where we shall end for today. Let me tell you something. I'm pretty sure Disney still has the rights to that book series. And if they don't, HBO Max, Paramount Plus, Hulu, Netflix, Disney, make a series out of this. You can't really do this story as a movie. There is two... Mm, you could do the final book as a two-parter. And each of the individual books, if done right, could be singular movies. You could totally do that. Considering that Greta Gerwig is directing and writing the script. If I'm not mistaken, she's directing and writing the script for the Chronicles of Narnia Netflix series that's going to be coming out soon. It's going to be coming out, if I'm not mistaken, probably late next year or early 2026. This is a series that makes me love fantasy. I love out of all of the genres of books that I love to read, mystery and fantasy are tied. Probably after that would be science fiction, adventure novels, and probably um realistic fiction. I love realistic fiction. So an example of that would be like Encyclopedia Brown, The Hardy Boys, which is a mystery series, and Nancy Drew. Um, yeah. Another example of realistic fiction would be Ed of Green Gables. Hmm. But Anne, Anne Shirley is based off of a real person, but the story itself is, in a way, fictional. But, without further ado, I'm going to get on Instagram. I love y'all. I'll see you next time.